So let's start as we usually do with some prayers, taking refuge and so on. It would help us if the it was bigger. <laughs> Thank you. And so while reciting the prayers, if you can, imagine the Buddha in the space in front. Shakyamuni Buddha, you can think that he embodies all the Buddhas, all the enlightened beings, all root and lineage, spiritual masters, all the bodhisattvas, arhats, aryas, so all the objects of refuge embodied by this one figure of the Buddha, made of light, radiant, and try to really feel the qualities emanating from the Buddha, <clears throat> a mind completely peaceful, free of all disturbing thoughts and emotions, all the afflictions may never arise in the Buddha's mind. So it's the mind that's totally peaceful and pure and filled with only positive qualities such as universal compassion, seeing each and every sentient being and the suffering we're experiencing, wanting to help us, totally dedicated to doing whatever is possible to help each and every one of us and never getting tired of doing that, but willing to continue working to help us until every last being has reached enlightenment. <clears throat> An incredible wisdom, understanding the true nature of things and also skillful means, knowing what is the best way to help each and every living being and guide them in their spiritual path up to enlightenment? <clears throat> so those are some of the excellent qualities that the Buddha has. <clears throat> I try to feel that being in the Buddha's presence, you are receiving this positive energy, the love and compassion and complete acceptance of you just as you are without any judgmentalness or criticalness or aversion, just totally loving and accepting and caring and wanting to help us. <clears throat> and if you can imagine all other living beings around us taking refuge in the Buddha and also receiving the Buddha's positive energy, energy of compassion and wisdom and guidance, guiding us to so imagine together with all sentient beings, we are taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. To the Buddha, to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Spirit of Sunday. By my practice of giving our perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity 
free from attachment to friends and hatred for enemies. <coughs> Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Tandaya and then while we recite the mantra of the Buddha, you can imagine light and nectar flowing from the Buddha, from his whole body, into yourself and also into all other living beings around us. The light and nectar represent the Buddha's wisdom and realizations and all his excellent qualities. And as we are filled with this light and nectar, it purifies our negative karma, defilements, and so on, oh, negative things in our body and mind. And it nourishes our positive potential so that we can develop the same qualities and knowledge and realizations as the Buddha. <clears throat> Taya ta o mane mane maha manaye so ha taya ta o mane mane maha manaye so ha taya ta o mane maha manaye so ha Tired I take a few moments to recall bodhicitta motivation that you generated earlier today or if you didn't do that already then do it now so that you um, have the understanding that you're here listening participating in this class not just for your own happiness but for the benefit of all living beings and also not just for short-term temporal goals but for the long-term goal of becoming enlightened, fully enlightened Buddha, to be able to benefit all beings in the best possible way.
Now let's do some meditation. Since we are learning about the four foundations of mindfulness or the four establishments of mindfulness, and we're still on the first of these four, which is mindfulness of the body. And we've been going through different practices uh, related to mindfulness of the body. So I thought we could just start with a few minutes of meditation on the breathing. It's the first of the practices taught by the Buddha. And then last time we looked at um, mindfulness of, of the parts of the body. And I thought to just read the words of the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutra, Sutra on the Establishments of Mindfulness. And um, so in this part of the Sutra, the Buddha mentions the 32 parts of the body. So I'll just, I'll read them slowly and just pause uh, a few moments on each of these parts of the body, giving you a chance to just briefly reflect that our body is composed of these, these different um, parts, different substances, and so on. So get more familiar with them. <clears throat> so let's start with some meditation on the breathing. So again, what the Buddha instructed in the sutra is to sit in a quiet place with the legs crossed, but it's fine to meditate in a chair um, and having the back straight. And then just um, focusing our attention on the breathing and being aware as we are breathing in, aware that we are breathing in, and as we are breathing out, aware that we are breathing out. So we'll just, we'll just do that part of the practice, just awareness of breathing in and breathing out, and try to have mindfulness. Mindfulness in this case means not forgetting the breath, remembering the breath, remembering to keep your awareness on the breath, and also try to have introspective awareness or vigilance, which is like a little, little spy watching the mind and checking what it's doing and able to recognize if it is paying attention to the breath or if it's wandered away and is thinking about something else. And then it, if it has wandered away, then letting go of that other uh, thought or whatever the distraction is and um, bringing it back to the breath, renewing mindfulness on the breath. So let's just do that for a few minutes.
So now here are the words of the Buddha from the Satipatthana Sutra, uh, the part of the sutra about the, the body, the parts of the body. <clears throat> so the Buddha says, a meditator reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things. In this body, there are head hairs, body hairs, Nails, like fingernails, toenails, teeth, skin. Flesh, tendons, some translations say muscles. <clears throat> or connective tissue. There's various ways of translating that one. Bones. bone marrow kidneys Heart, liver. Laura.
spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, stomach, feces, brain, bile, Lem Pass Blood, sweat, Fat, tears, Skin oil, this is like the grease that sometimes appears on our forehead or palms of our hands. Saliva. Mucus, fat. 
fluid in the joints. Urine. So those are the 32 parts mentioned by the Buddha. There are other parts not mentioned, but those are the main ones. They are all impermanent, subject to change. They are changing every moment. They will not last forever. Our body will not last forever. So this is one of the first things to learn to understand about the body and its parts is its impermanent nature. So just ask yourself, is there anything here in the body that is worth being attached to? <clears throat> so as i mentioned last time the ideal way of going about this practice is to uh, get familiar with each part of the body like um, where it's located its color shape substance and function and so on and um, that, that would obviously take time, but someone who's like a full-time meditator would have the time to do that. <laughs> and then um, and then memorize uh, all that material. And then you would be able to go through all the 32 parts in different orders, like front, you know, from start to finish and then backwards and so on. And if you're really familiar with each part of the body, it's location function and so on then you all that information will come to your mind um, each time you do the meditation so as you can imagine it would be very powerful to do to work on this and i was also thinking another practice we can do related to our body is to just observe the thoughts and feelings that arise in our mind in, the, in relation to our body, for example, when we look in the mirror or just looking at our body, the parts of our body that are visible to us, like our arms and hands and, and so on. And just, just notice, you know, have, have mindfulness, introspective awareness. Notice what kind of thoughts and feelings come up in your mind regarding your body and check if they are realistic and helpful or if they're unrealistic and unhelpful. And also it may happen sometimes that people make comments about our body. Sometimes they may make complimentary comments, you know, how attractive you are, how nice your hair is or whatever. But other times they may make comments that aren't so complimentary. Um, just for example, <laughs> Some years ago, I was living in, I was staying in San Francisco for, for a short time, and I had to shop and cook for myself. So one day I was in this big um, natural food store, and when I went to the checkout stand, um, the cashier, you know, was checking up my, checking um, out my, my items, and then he asked, um, do you qualify for a senior discount? <laughs> and I, I'm not sure how old I was at that time. I think I may have been in my 50s. I was probably in my 50s. So I asked him, well, how old do I have to be? And he said, 65. <laughs> and I 
was kind of <laughs> I was kind of devastated. <laughs> <laughs> I think I must have showed it in my face because then he, he he sort of said, well, you know, you, you never know how old people are. <laughs> but yeah, by that, by my reaction, I could see that, yeah, I was still quite concerned about things like, yeah, appearance and wanting to look young and not wanting to look old. And but you know, this guy seemed to think I looked 10 years older than I was. So didn't feel too happy about that. So yeah, the, the examples like that, you know, where, um, yeah, certain kinds of reactions come up in our mind that can reveal to us what attitudes we have about our body and about our I, our sense of self, our I in relation to our body. Also, you might notice when when you... Uh, you know, when we look at others' bodies, our mind will sometimes make comparisons. You know, my body's better than yours, or your body's better than mine, or, you know, and then jealousy may arise, or arrogance. Um, so it's just helpful to, to make that kind of observation of our thoughts and feelings and attitudes about our body. So I think this practice of mindfulness of the body helps us recognize unhelpful and unrealistic attitudes that we may have um, about our body, our own body, and also the bodies of others so that we can work on them. But it can be difficult to work on those attitudes if we are mostly around people who have those attitudes, <laughs> like most people in the world are quite attached to their body, quite attached to how they look, spend a lot of time and energy, you know, trying to make themselves look good and um, and very unhappy if they don't look good and, and so on. So in, norm, in normal society, among normal people, those are the kind of attitudes they have. So it could be difficult if we're around people like that all the time, then, you know, to be able to recognize those attitudes as unrealistic and unhelpful and then work on them. And also if we spend a lot of time uh, watching, you know, TV or movies, uh, media, advertisements and so on that are just kind of constantly throwing at us images of attractive young bodies, usually to encourage us to buy things like cosmetics or clothing cars cigarettes whatever um so yeah being constantly <clears throat> exposed to those kinds of of images uh could also make it more difficult on the other hand if we're really mindful really concerned about working on our mind working on our attitudes then those would give us the opportunity to recognize what attitudes we do have that need to be worked on. But this is another reason why it's good to spend time with Buddhist teachers and also fellow practitioners who are really dedicated to working on their mind and their attitudes um, about the body. Um, so I wanted to talk about one thing. If you could, Paola, if you could put up the slides. Um, something I just briefly mentioned last week, but I didn't actually have it on the on the slide. Um, and so I wanted to go through it again. Some of you are probably quite familiar with this topic, but for some it might be new. Um, so there are these four misconceptions that ordinary beings like ourselves have with regard to the first noble truth, uh, usually called true suffering or true dukkha. Dukkha is the Sanskrit and Pali term um, that's sometimes translated as sufferings. And, you know, when we hear the term true suffering, we might think it's just talking about feelings or experiences of suffering, like, you know, depression or in pain and, and so on. But actually the term true suffering in the Four Noble Truths, it refers not just to experiences of suffering, 
but to actual, but to phenomena um, that come into existence due to um, karma and afflictions. So all the phenomena of samsara, that includes our body and our mind and the things in the world around us. So all of these things are actually true suffering, true dukkha, because they are products of karma, contaminated karma and afflictions, especially ignorance. So, um, so in the Buddhist scriptures, it mentions these four misconceptions that ordinary beings have with regard to true dukkha, true sufferings. So, for example, our body. So now we're talking about our own body and the bodies of others. So we'll look at how we can have these misconceptions about our body. <clears throat> so the first misconception is believing that impermanent things are permanent. So our body and our mind and um, all the things we deal with in our world, our environment are impermanent by nature. Their very nature is impermanent. They come into existence through independence on causes and conditions. And because of that, they're by nature changing all the time. Whatever arises from causes and conditions inevitably changes, not just occasionally, but all the time, constantly. That's just the nature of, of conditioned things, things that arise from causes and conditions. And so, um, so that's the case with our bodies, with our minds, and all the material things in the world around us. All these things are impermanent, changing all the time. And when we think about it, you know, intellectually, we can agree with that. We can say, yeah, I know, I know, I know, things are impermanent, things are changing. And yet we tend to have this, um, this kind of deep, habitual uh, grasping of things as permanent. And we can see that with regard to our body. Um, you know, when we notice changes in our body, unwanted changes, <laughs> like wrinkles and gray hair and age spots and, um, and so on, the, the, the kind of changes that become very obvious the more you, the older you get. Um, and if we feel unhappy about that, and we feel, why does this have to happen? I don't want this to happen. Well, that kind of reaction shows that we don't really accept the impermanent nature of our body. <clears throat> and so this is one of the things the Buddha was putting a lot of emphasis on, talking about a lot, impermanence, meditating on impermanence. And so, you know, in these practices of mindfulness of the body, including right from the beginning, mindfulness of the breathing, you know, if we really practice that and are really paying attention as we're breathing in and out, then inevitably we notice impermanence. Our, our breath is changing. Our body is changing. <clears throat> yeah, so getting more familiar with the real nature of our body helps us accept impermanence. And, and the whole purpose of um, these practices is to develop renunciation or the determination to be free from samsara, the situation in which we are born into bodies, impermanent, uh, unsatisfactory bodies again and again and again. We need to realize that, that these things are not satisfying. They're not going to give us lasting happiness and pleasure. So we need to see that very clearly so that we let go of our attachment, become disillusioned, disenchanted, and then have the wish to, to become free, free of samsara. Uh, then the second misconception is believing that unsatisfying things are satisfying or pleasurable. So unsatisfying is another way of translating this term dukkha the first noble truth, dukkha. Um, it's normally translated as suffering, but suffering is such a heavy word. And, you know, usually we think, 
when we hear suffering, we think of, you know, like the war in Ukraine or people starving or dying of cancer, really heavy, terrible experiences. But as we know, like in the three types of suffering, um, the first of the three types of suffering refers to those really heavy, gross, coarse types of suffering. But the second type of suffering, suffering of change, refers to um, pleasant experiences, things that we think of as pleasant and, and enjoyable, but in fact, they're just another type of suffering because they don't satisfy, they don't last, they don't completely take away our problems, they don't completely satisfy us, you know, bring lasting pleasure and happiness. So those types of experiences like eating food, sleeping, um, you know, listening to music, uh, if we look very, very carefully at those experiences, we can see that they're not fully satisfying. They're actually unsatisfying. So they're another type of dukkha, another type of unsatisfactoriness. And then there's the third type of suffering, which basically means just having a body and mind aggregates that come about from afflicted afflictions and karma causes of suffering so so this body and mind was not created by a perfect god which is what many people in the world believe um you know this perfect loving creator created us and so they somehow have this idea that god's creation is wonderful um but according to buddhism there is no such creator of our bodies and um, the world and all the things in the world, but rather the creators are karma and afflictions, ignorance, greed, hatred, and contaminated karma. Those are the creators. Those are the things from which our bodies, our minds, and um, at least the you know diluted aspects of our mind, and all the things in the world around us, they all arise from those causes. And since those causes are imperfect, and faulty, full of flaws, then the results, the consequences, what is produced by them is also naturally um, imperfect and flawed. So, you know, it's just understandable. It's just the nature of all the things in samsara that arise from um, ignorance, afflictions, karma, that they are unsatisfying, imperfect. We're not going to be able to find genuine, long-lasting happiness and satisfaction in samsara. So that's also, yeah, you know, we tend to not recognize that. And instead we think, oh, chocolate, mm, delicious, coffee, tea, ice cream, <laughs> all these things, beautiful music, interesting movies. So, so many things that appear um pleasurable, enjoyable, that they're going to satisfy us. They're going to bring us happiness, long-lasting happiness. But this is an illusion. This is a mistake. So if we look very carefully at these things, such as our body, look very carefully at bodies and see what's what they're all about, what's really there, and ask ourselves, is this really pleasurable? Is this really satisfying? Is this really the source of long-lasting happiness and pleasure. So again, this meditation, these, these meditations on the body, mindfulness of the body, help us to wake up to this reality that these things are actually unsatisfactory, unsatisfying. And again, the purpose is to generate um, disillusionment, disenchantment with samsara, so that we generate that strong determination to be free, to get ourselves out and get to enlightenment and be able to help others get out as well. And the third uh, misconception is that unattractive things are attractive. So again, with the body, last week I talked about how probably most people regard bodies as uh, things that are attractive, clean, and pure. And the media uh, certainly promotes this kind of view. And so, in, you know, in Buddhism, we understand that 
having such a view, seeing the body as incredibly wonderful and uh, pure and clean and um, attractive, that kind of view is actually counterproductive to spiritual practice because then that is the basis for attachment, having attachment to bodies, our own bodies and the bodies of others. And that's you know one of the main things that keeps us stuck in samsara, coming back again and again and again, wanting another body again and again and again. So we keep cycling through the wheel of life, samsara. And, and also it's unrealistic if we you know, really look carefully at the body, like those 32 parts of the body, um, and ask ourselves, is there anything there that's really attractive? Something to be attached to. <clears throat> and, and as we looked at last time, even those parts of the body that are usually regarded as attractive, like eyes or skin or hair, if we look at them carefully, really study them carefully, um, then we get quite a different view. For example, um, I guess I'll show the, uh, uh, not now, but in the, in the next slide, um, there are pictures of, of skin that have been magnified, like, I don't know, many, many times. <laughs> when, you look, when you look at the skin under a microscope, it looks quite different and not very attractive at all. And in fact, when I was looking for these photos, um, I came across a couple of blogs by uh, young women who did this. You know, they, they got this super strong microscope and they looked at their skin under the microscope and they were like shocked and horrified. And one even said, I can't, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have to, you know, when we're doing this kind of practice, um, it's within a certain context. It's within the, within the context of, of the Buddhist worldview and the Buddhist path. And so, you know, yeah, we may feel some shock and some disgust when we look at the parts of the body, but we have to remind ourselves, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? It's not just to generate those kind of feelings of disgust and aversion, but it's to uh, generate renunciation, which is a very powerful, very positive uh, realization, state of mind that um, impels us on the path to nirvana, to liberation and to enlightenment. So, so there's a context for, for, for doing this kind of thing. But if people do this kind of thing without any, such a context, I don't know. Yeah, they may end up just being maybe traumatized. Not very helpful. And then fourth, uh, misconception is believing that things that lack a self have a self. And so the term self can refer to different, um, uh, well, here in this context, it's referring not to like a conventionally existent self, but a false notion of self. Um, so, for example, uh, at the time of the Buddha, and, and still today, there are uh, certain schools of philosophy or religion in India that teach the existence of a kind of self or soul, such as there's two examples here, um, a permanent, unitary, and independent self. So this was you know, one type of self or soul that certain non-Buddhist schools believed in and taught to their followers and their followers, you know, believe, yeah, there is such a self, such a soul that's permanent, unchanging, unitary, doesn't have parts. It's one whole monolithic thing and independent, independent of our body and mind somehow within us there's that kind of self or soul, and they believe that is what continues to exist after death, leaves the body and takes rebirth. The Buddha discovered 
in his practice, there's no such thing. This is just a fantasy or mental fabrication, that there is no such self. And believing in that kind of self and being attached to that kind of self is actually a hindrance, an obstacle, something that keeps us in samsara. And then there's also the notion of, of self-supporting, substantially existent self. That's a somewhat more subtle notion of a self that um, it sort of appears like a boss or a controller, a uh, ruler of our body and mind. Yeah, so sometimes you might notice that in yourself. It seems like there's something inside of you that's direct the director of operations the, the 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 chief the ceo of this whole body mind complex you know controlling it telling it what to do and so on um so that's another notion of self that um some non-buddhist schools believe in but also lama tsongkhapa says everybody has that kind of notion of self it's an innate misconception of self that we have that kind of, of self within us and then the prasangikas talk about um, an inherently existing self which is even more subtle and also innate everybody has a sense of an inherently existing self a self that exists independent of everything else and isn't merely labeled by the mind but real objectively existing from its own side so there's various notions misconceptions about self a self an i a me um <clears throat> and um so it seems like you know our gut level feeling is there is some kind of self inside of us <laughs> it's Somewhere within this body-mind complex, there's a real I, a real me, a real self. And um, it's probably regarded not so much as the body itself, but as something living in the body, um, you know, like inhabiting the body and maybe controlling the body. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, it's there <laughs> somewhere connected with the body. And so this is a misconception that, um, for example, our body seems to have a self, there seems to be a self within it somewhere, but in reality, that isn't the case. That, that kind of self doesn't exist. So um, Jake Garfield <clears throat> um, is a Western philosopher, but also very interested in Buddhist philosophy, in particular Madhyamaka philosophy, and has translated various texts, um, Buddhist texts. And I once heard a talk he gave, it was one of the Mind Life conferences, and he was talking about different views of the self in Western philosophy. So we often hear about these you know, in the Buddhist tradition, they talk about these wrong conceptions of self. So it was interesting to hear. Um, I won't go through all of it, but, you know, he spoke about some of the views of self in Western philosophy and then kind of rejected those. And then, and then he said, one such view among many contemporary Western philosophers is that of an emergent self a self which is not an independent entity, but comes into being in dependence upon the com complete collection of all our cognitive and physical processes. Like a storm that comes into existence in dependence on many moments of wind, droplets of water and so forth, but can still be called one single storm. So I thought that's quite an apt, um, analogy especially right now there's all this talk about what is it hurricane ian hurricane ian that's heading towards florida or maybe it's already hit florida and um yeah so we we give it a name we give it that name hurricane ian 
and giving it a personal name as if it sounds like a person. But in reality, it's just all these moments of wind and droplets of water and, and so on. I mean, pretty powerful um, wind and water. Um, but any, anyway, it's like independence on those, those factors of wind and water and so on. We call this a storm, Hurricane Ian. And so in a similar way, some Western philosophers philosophers say that the self, a person, is like that. It's something that just um, arises in dependence on all the different parts of our body and mind. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, just as storms are very real, we could also say that the self is a real thing. And then he comments, this view contains a lot that is right. We start understanding the self as a constantly changing thing, that it exists in dependence on many other things. But those who believe in this view of self still say that the self is real, a substantially existent thing, as opposed to simply a convention, a conceptual designation, which is what Prasandika say. So they they got some things right, <laughs> but they're still attaching to this idea of itself much more reality, substantiality than um, than there is. And then he talks about another idea of of a self is that of a narrative self. This is the thinnest idea of self in the West. So in this view, the self is simply a character in a story we tell about our lives and not a real center of existence. Such a self could be constantly changing and merely conventional, but it has no powers, is not a center of consciousness, and has no real existence at all. And it makes some sense of adult consciousness, but hard to see infants developing such a narrative. So it can be argued against as a model of a core sense of self. But anyway, I don't fully understand <laughs> all these points he's making, but it's interesting that in the West, at least some people, philosophers, are exploring this whole idea of the self, what is a self, and coming up with these different different notions. <clears throat> and um, he seems quite taken by the Madhyamaka Prasangika notion of self, um, the way he talked about it, that that's, that's the right view. <laughs> that the self is merely labeled um, and dependent on the aggregates, but also dependent on the mind, um, the mind imputing it, labeling it. So this is a very difficult, of the four misconceptions, this is probably the most difficult one, the notion of self, because we tend to be very attached to a sense of self. It seems real, you know, that's how it is to me, you know, um, especially when we get emotional, we have strong emotion coming up and it's like, it seems undeniable that there is a self in there that's angry, that's been hurt, that's been mistreated, that wants something that isn't happening and so on and so forth. So it, it, you know, it seems so real. So some ideas about the self are learned. We learn them from religion, from philosophy, from society and so on. But other notions of self are innate, inborn especially the deepest misconception of the self, that uh, an inherently existing, objectively existing self is described by the Prasangika. And in the description of the object of negation, you know, this uh, inherently existing self, what we're trying to negate and realize doesn't really exist, um, the fifth Dalai Lama, uh, is is regarded as giving a very clear explanation of how this sense of self manifests, and and he says it does sometimes appear in relation to our body. 
Um, so in his text, um, the Lamrim text, he says, sometimes it will seem to be related with the body. Sometimes it will seem to be related with the mind. Sometimes it will seem to be related with other individual aggregates and so forth. At the end of the arising of such a variety of modes of appearance, you will come to identify an I that exists in its own right, that exists inherently, that from the start is self-established, existing undifferentiatedly in relation to the body and mind, which are also mixed like milk and water. So that's just a little um, section of his quite nice long description of how to identify the object of negation, the inherently existing I or inherently existing self in the meditation on emptiness. So I think I think that meditating on the parts of the body um, that we've been talking about is is helpful when it comes to meditating on emptiness. Because when we do meditate on emptiness, um, you know, one type of meditation involves trying to trying to find some part of ourselves that we can point to as being the I. Yeah, it feels like that. It feels like there is an I inside of us, and then we're supposed to look for it. You know, and and one way of doing that is to go through the parts of the body and see if you can find some part of the body that you can point to and say that's it right there that's my eye and I personally find that really helpful especially when I do have a strong feeling of an eye like an emotional eye it feels so real and so solid and some it, it, it actually does seem to be located in some part of my body so then I think about well what is actually there Okay, there's bones and there's blood vessels and there's tissue and there's cells. I mean, is that me? Is are those things the eye? <laughs> and so I find it really helps to dispel that notion of a of a strong and real eye. <clears throat> so the next slide is is just. <laughs> I hope it doesn't gross you out, but these are some photos, <laughs> photos of skin. So the one on the top is skin on the forehead that's magnified 500 times. So it looks like a, a moonscape or something. Not particularly beautiful. And the one on the bottom is pretty amazing. Um, this is a photo of a hair follicle. I think it was an eyebrow, like, you know, um, we're an eyebrow and the green thing is is the hair coming out and the pink thing is a mite it's the tail of a mite because they say that we have these insects these insects living on our skin and in our in our pores and hair follicles and so and they're extremely minute I don't know what magnitude this is but um but yeah, just the thought of that, that there's these little itty bitty creatures. I, I guess they're sentient beings. I don't know. They're mites, they're spiders. That's how they're classified. So I guess they're sentient beings. So they're living on our on our face and our pores and our eyebrows and so on. So yeah, in case you ever think that, you know, somebody's skin is beautiful, <laughs> attractive. <laughs> Think again. <laughs> Look more carefully. <laughs> but remember, as I said last time, uh, and I read from the book, um, following the Buddha's footsteps, that um, the ideal attitude to have when it comes to the body and the parts of the body and so on is a balanced one, neither um, having attachment and these fantasized views of the body, how wonderful the body is, how beautiful the body is. So avoiding that extreme. But the other extreme is aversion, you know, thinking, hating, hating bodies, uh, thinking bodies are horrible and disgusting, wishing we didn't have one and so on. So that kind of attitude is, is to be avoided as well. That's not at all the point 
of this meditation. So instead, just just being aware in, in, a, in a very realistic way of what the body is made of and, um, and then trying to avoid those two attitudes. And so be on the lookout for those attitudes, either attachment or aversion, disgust, hatred. Um, and if they do arise, deal with them. So for attachment, um, then contemplate the impermanent nature of the body, how it is unsatisfactory, how it is not really that wonderful, fantastic, beautiful, and clean, and so on. And then with, you know, if there's a feeling of aversion or disgust or hatred, then contemplate the precious human life, how fortunate we are to have the body that we have, the human body, Buddha said, this is the best situation in which to learn and practice the Dharma. And so we should feel grateful that we have this body and take care of it, keep it alive and healthy as long as possible so that we can use it to engage in Dharma practice. And I think it's also helpful to contemplate Buddha nature you know, and that um, within our mind, there are these factors, such as the emptiness of the mind, and the positive qualities of the mind. These are our Buddha nature. They have the potential to transform into the bodies of a Buddha. And um, so focus more on those and identify more with those aspects of our being. Um, and see the body as I like in the 37, what is it, the 37 practices text by Togme Zongbo. He talks about the body being like a guest house. I like that analogy. <laughs> um, that, yeah, it's just a temporary abode for our mind, our consciousness, as it's as it's traveling on the path to enlightenment. It needs someplace to go, someplace to be, someplace to live. So and they say, like, with regard to a guest house, if you're if you're a traveler and you're just staying one or two nights in a hotel, you don't get all involved with a hotel room and want to want to repaint the walls and redo the curtains and you know clean the spots on the carpet. You know you're not going to be there long, and so <laughs> you just kind of ignore those things. And so, in a similar way, you know, if we think that. We're not going to be in this body forever. It's temporary. It's just a temporary home, like a guest house. And we don't get so bothered about, you know, little things that, little imperfections, things that may not look so great or work so well. So have a reasonable, you know, take care of our body in a reasonable way, not overdoing it nor underdoing it. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so then the next practice of mindfulness of the body is mindfulness of the elements. And so this is also a way of looking at the parts of the body, but they're more subtle parts. <clears throat> so could we have the slides? <clears throat> Um, so in Asia, and I guess it was also the case in ancient Greece and Egypt, there's this um, system of talking about the four elements that all material things, all physical things are made up of four elements, which are earth, water, fire, and air or wind. And, and so this is true for all the material things in the world, the world itself, mountains, trees, lakes, rocks, and, um, and also our bodies and, and all the things that we produce like food and buildings, houses, furniture, clothes, and so on. So all material things, all physical things are said to be composed of these four elements. And so in the sutra, the Satipatthana Sutra, the Buddha spoke about um, you know, meditating on that, meditating on the four elements of our body. 
So um, I've always found this topic a bit puzzling because it's not something we talk about. <laughs> you know, it's not part of our education system to learn about the four elements. And in fact, I think scientists would probably poo poo this whole idea. <laughs> But anyway, it's in the Buddhist scriptures and so can be useful to contemplate. So these four elements are actually more like properties rather than like particles that things are composed of. So, for example, the first is called the earth element. And, you know, when we encounter that term earth, we probably think of dirt. Yeah, like they're digging up over here, <laughs> making a big mountain of, of earth. But it isn't that. It's more um, <clears throat> the earth element is the quality of solidity or mass and is experienced as hardness. So the earth element is present in, again, all of physical material things, but in some things it's more predominant. For example, hard things like rock, wood, metal, hard plastic, <laughs> glass. So in those types of, of materials, the, the earth element is, is predominant, it predominates. But it's also present in like our skin. So well, there's a certain amount of earth element in our skin. And I mean, we can see that the skin does it obstruct. It, it, it's resistant, you know, you can't kind of put your hand right through it. <laughs> um, there's a certain amount of hardness there. <clears throat> and then with, but, but other parts of our body um, have, are, have a, a a stronger um, percentage of the earth element, like teeth and bones, nails. So those are body parts that are, that are harder. <clears throat> then the second is the water element. And so again, this doesn't mean actual water, like what we drink and bathe with and so on. But the water element is the property of cohesion. And so it functions to bind things together. So for example, when we're making bread or cake or you know baked goods, we have flour, all these little particles of flour and we put liquid water or milk or whatever. And that causes all the particles to stick together so we can you know, make bread. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it binds things together. <clears throat> and experientially, it is wet and flowing. And so body parts that contain a predominance of the water element would be like our blood, saliva, tears, mucus, urine, and so on. But again, the water element is present in all the other parts of the body as well. Um, like bones, even bones, I don't have it here, but um, yeah, even bones, they're made of cells and cells contain liquid. So even bones, the bones are quite hard, but they do contain a certain amount of the water element. In fact, I think what what percentage of the body is water? It's quite yeah. <clears throat> I think it's seventy percent. Huh? I think it's seventy percent, but I could be wrong. I don't drink enough water, so maybe that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> And then the third element is called the fire element. And yeah, we probably think of actual flames, but the fire element is actually the property of heat. And that's how it's experienced. It's experienced as heat. And so there is heat in our body. 
Now you think about what's the normal temperature of our body, 98.6, that's pretty warm. <laughs> um, we sit on a chair and af after sitting on a chair for a while, we get up and it's warm. <laughs> so there's just natural heat in our body. Also our digest, digest, digestive system um, requires heat, utilizes heat to digest our food. Um, and then the air element, the fourth one, is the property of expansion and is experienced as movement. So the most obvious form of the air element in our body would be our breathing, our breath. So we breathe and the air, I don't know much about physiology, but you know it brings in certain nutrients, certain materials that are needed by the body lungs in particular, but also other parts of the body. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of movement happening all the time in our body. Um, blood is moving, different other substances are moving, um, cells are moving. So this is related to the air element. <clears throat> So it is helpful to have some understanding, some awareness of the elements, because it does come up in the Buddhist scriptures. For example, this verse from Nagarjuna, um, you may have encountered, this is in the, this text, the precious garland. And, and this is one way of contemplating um, emptiness, the emptiness of a self, a person, an I, sense of I. Uh, or we're meditating on the emptiness of another person. He says, a person is not earth, not water, not fire, not wind. Now, in this verse, he adds two more elements, space and consciousness. So they do sometimes talk about six elements rather than four. But the last two are not... Um, are not parts of all physical phenomena, like consciousness. So consciousness is part of a person, a human being, a living being, but it, not a rock. So it wouldn't be included in a rock or a tree or, or something like that. And then the space, um, I think most phenomena do have space, like there's space in our body, our stomach, and yeah, cavities of our body, even in cells, even among between atoms and tiny particles, <laughs> there's a lot of space. So there's space within our body, but it's not a physical thing. Space is not a physical material thing, but it's still sometimes included in lists of elements. So anyway, Nagarjun is going through these different elements and um, well, he's saying, he's coming to the conclusion that none of these is a person, but that's something we need to investigate ourselves to look at all the, these elements, these parts of our being and ask ourselves if any of these is me, is the person. And then he goes on to say, and, and a person is also not all of them together, the whole combination, the whole collection of all these parts. Um, so what person is there other than these? So it's helpful to have awareness of the different elements so that we can do this kind of reflection as mentioned by Nagarjuna. So let's do a little bit of meditation on these elements in our body. See if we can get more familiar with them. So be comfortable, <clears throat> relax, pay attention to the breath flowing in and out to settle your mind down in the present, the here and now.
Now become aware of the earth element in your body. Again, this is the property of solidity and is experienced as hardness. So it's most obvious in body parts like our bones, our teeth, our nails. But it's also present in every other part of our body, even though they are, seem to be softer. So our skin, tissue, organs, even though these are more soft, they do resist pressure to a certain extent and act as protective barriers to unwanted things passing through. And now become aware of the water element in the body. This is the property of cohesion and is experienced as wetness. So the most obvious parts of the body where we can see the water element would be like saliva, tears, blood, mucus, phlegm, urine. But it's also, <clears throat> it's also present in other parts of the body. For example, cells, the cells of our body are 70% water. Our lungs are 83% water. Even our bones are 31% water. And then there's the fire element, which is the heat in our body. So the temperature of our body is usually around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So heat in the body is important for the digestion of food, for keeping our body warm when the weather is cold. And it's also present in all the parts of the body, even the skin, the bones, the organs, and so on.
And then finally, there's the air element, which is the property of expansion and experienced as movement. So we can see it most clearly in our respiration, breathing in and breathing out, which our body does continuously all day, all night. The air element is also involved in movement, so being able to move our body, our arms, hands, legs, eyes, mouth, and so forth. So this is due to the presence of the air element. There's also internal movement all the time in our body, such as in the flow of the blood, the movement of tiny particles like cells, molecules, atoms. All this movement is due to the air element. So all of these elements are impermanent, changing every moment. And they are not so fixed. We, we tend to have this sense of my body as if there's a impenetrable barrier between our body and the outside world. But all the things in the world around us are also composed of the four elements. And there's a constant interchange taking place. For example, we breathe in and out. So we're taking in air element from the outside and breathing out air element to the outside. And bits of our skin are constantly falling off onto the ground or lying around in the air. When we eat and drink, we are taking in elements from the outside. We are also passing out elements. After the food and drink has been digested, it comes out as feces, urine, and so on. Again, it mixes with the external world, external elements. So given that, does it make sense to have this strong sense of I in relation to this body, like this is me or this is my body, as if it's totally disconnected from everything outside of us and around us? <clears throat> in the Satipatthana Sutra, when the Buddha was talking about the elements of the body, how the body's made up these four elements, he gave this interesting analogy. <laughs> uh, is he, he used the analogy of 
um, an animal being uh, killed and then um, cut up for meat, like a cow or pig or sheep or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a gruesome analogy and not very um, in accord with Buddhism, but I think the point is it does happen, you know, every day. There's probably millions or billions of animals that are killed and then immediately chopped up into pieces. And and so like before before the animal was killed and butchered, it, it appeared like a cow or a sheep or a pig. But then once it's cut into pieces and you know, people buy different pieces of the animal and take them home and cook them. Um, then there's no longer this notion of a cow or a sheep or a pig. Instead, people say, I'm eating a steak. They don't say, I'm eating a cow. They say, I'm eating a steak or I'm eating um, bacon or lamb chops. <laughs> and so, so the point of this analogy is that when we um, kind of separate our own body mentally, of course, you know, mentally um, in our imagination, we we separate our body into these different elements. Then we get a very different sense of our of ourself and our body. Instead of one whole body, me, I, human being, man, woman, whatever, we see it in terms of these um, these different parts earth, water, fire, and wind. So it helps to decrease the sense of a strong, uh, solid, real I or, or person and that vanishes. And that's something to contemplate. Okay, so there's one more <clears throat> practice related to the body. Um, I won't go into details with this, which you'll probably be thankful about. Um, this is mindfulness of the body as a corpse. So there's a slide um, related to that. If, um... <clears throat> Um, so in the Satipatthana Sutra, the Buddha recommends um, contemplating a corpse in nine different stages of decomposition, starting with a body and like a corpse that's just a few days old and is uh, bloated and bluish, and then goes through various changes uh, until the end probably after, you know, if it's just left somewhere um, and um, decomposes and eventually it just becomes a pile of bones and then even the bones themselves crumble into dust that's blown around. So you, you may have heard that in India, <coughs> in, the, in the time of the Buddha, um, when when some people died, I don't know if this was the case for everybody, but maybe people who didn't have money to have a proper funeral <laughs> and cremation and so on, their bodies would just be um, taken to a certain place, like they call it a charnel ground, and they would just be laid out on the ground, and then um, various animals would come and you know find something to eat, <laughs> tear the body into pieces and eat them. And um, yeah, eventually the body would end up like that, just a pile of bones and then dust. And the Buddha advised his um, followers, his monks, to go to those places and observe the, the bodies and just become really familiar with how this is what happens to bodies. And, and he specifically said, um, you know, as you observe uh, what happens to these these bodies in the charnel ground, you need to think this is no, my body is the same. This is going to happen to my body as well. <clears throat> so nowadays, most of us don't have 
I don't know if there are such places like that, even in India now. So we probably don't have the opportunity to actually observe a corpse decomposing, but we can use our imagination. I've heard in Thailand, uh, I've even seen photos, um, uh, some people devote, you know, very devoted disciples of a, of a teacher or a monastery will bequeath their body to the monastery. So they say, you know, when my body is, when I've died, you can have my body. And I saw one photo where the body was put into a kind of glass case out, outside. And so, you know, the monks, the practitioners in the monastery could observe the body as it's decomposing. So they did have the opportunity to really directly see what happens to the body. Um, and um, and also, as Venerable Children mentioned, um, they, are, they are given permission to attend autopsies. Uh, and she herself attended one and shared some photos with us. So that's also very helpful to see. Well, that's more related to the parts of the body. Um, but yeah, anyway, there might be places, situations where you would have the opportunity to ob directly observe bodies as they're changing, going through these changes. Otherwise, we just have to use our imagination. But um, but this this kind of practice is 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 um, not recommended for beginners. <laughs> so the book uh, following in the Buddha's footsteps says before doing this meditation, it is advisable to have some experience in meditation and to have heard teachings on the four truths. And so we also need to understand the purpose, the purpose of this. It's not, you know, we're not being morbid, obsessed with death or anything. But again, it's to um, overcome attachment to the body and these other unrealistic ideas that we have, body being permanent, body being beautiful, wonderful, fantastic, a source of pleasure. <laughs> so these are misconceptions we have and they need to be overcome to be free of samsara. So that's, um, that's the reason, the purpose for doing this kind of practice. So the full version of this meditation has nine different points. Um, if you're really interested, you can find information about them. Um, they're in the book, Following the Buddhist Footsteps, but other books about the foundations of mindfulness. So I'm not going to go into all of them now. But yeah, the last bullet point says this is this is the buddha's advice uh, with each of these stages that one should compare one's own body with the corpse and think this body too this body of mind is of the same nature it will be like that it is not exempt from that fate so my body will become like that so very powerful to overcome attachment so I have one more thing I wanted to share today. Um, so the next slide. So these are some passages in the Satipatthana Sutra. The first one um, is near the beginning of the sutra before the Buddha even uh, explains how to meditate on the body. Um, it's kind of a prelude to that. So it says here, a monastic abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, introspectively aware, mindful, having removed longing and displeasure for the world. So um, I read a commentary to this by Tana Sarupiku. He's an American Buddhist monk and uh, translator and author. And this expression, the body as a body, um, he translates it as the body in and of itself. 
And he says, what that means is viewing the body on its own terms rather than in terms of its function in the world. For example, beautiful or uh, agile, strong, you know, a marvelous machine. Yeah, so not having those kind of notions of the body, but just viewing the body as a body in itself, in, a, in its own nature not relating to the world and people and so on. And then ardent, the term ardent means um, like zeal, having zeal, diligence, uh, strong determination, strong effort to do this practice. Um, and then introspectively aware, that means having introspective alertness or vigilance, um, really focusing on what we are doing and aware of our mind and knowing which states of mind are skillful and to be cultivated and which states of mind are unskillful and to be abandoned and so on. Mindful, having mindfulness, keeping our attention on the practice, not letting it wander elsewhere. And then the last phrase is having removed longing and displeasure for the world. So that means while doing this practice, keeping our mind free of um, attachment and aversion regarding sense objects, things we see, hear, smell, and so on. And uh, the eight worldly concerns, being concerned about reputation, what people think about us. Um, so our mind can easily get distracted when these kind of things pop up in our mind. Memories of past experiences or fantasies about future experiences. Um, so we need to, again, keep keep watch on our mind and notice when our mind is getting caught up in those attachments and aversions. And of course we can't do that right from the beginning, but this is the ideal. It's something to work towards. Um, we try to not let our mind follow thoughts of attachment and aversion, longing and displeasure for the world. And, um, so that's kind of general instructions, general guidelines um, you know, to keep in mind while doing these practices of mindfulness of the body and so on. And then the next passage, which is a little bit long. So this is um, repeated again and again with regard to the various practices of mindfulness of the body. But he also, Buddha also uses it for the other, for the other three um, practices of mindfulness of feelings, mind, and phenomena. So it's broken into four parts. Um, so it says, in this way, he it says he, but you can think he, she, they, anyone who's doing this practice abides contemplating the body as a body internally abides contemplating the body as a body externally abides contemplating the body as a body both internally and externally so um internally here the way it's explained in the commentaries it means one's own body so you're you're contemplating your own body in and of itself and then externally means others' bodies. So you also, the Buddha um, is advising us to also uh, do this practice of mindfulness of the body with regard to others' bodies, not just our own. Although it's probably best to start with our own just to get familiar with it, but then carry it to others' bodies and understand others' bodies are made of parts and will decompose, become corpses and so on. And also breathing, yeah? Um, he talks about this with regard to breathing. So just being aware of others breathing as well as one's own. And then the last part says, uh, both internally and externally, 
So that means you would alternate. So with more practice, more familiarity with the practice, then you can alternate, sometimes contemplating your own body, sometimes contemplating others' bodies. <clears throat> then the second says, or else he abides contemplating in the body, its nature of arising, or he abides contemplating in the body, its nature of passing away, or he abides contemplating in the body, its nature of both arising and passing away. So this is talking about impermanence, having awareness of the impermanent nature of the body. So arising could be understood in a very coarse way, like our body is something that arises. It came into existence due to causes and conditions. It wasn't always there, but it you know, came into existence due to our parents and all the food we've eaten and so on. So it's something dependent on causes and conditions. And then passing away, you know, one day it will pass away, die, become a corpse. So that's coarse impermanence. But then subtle impermanence means arising and passing away or happening every moment. And this, the way I understand that is that whatever uh, the way the body exists in one moment, one point in time, has already changed in the next moment. It's no longer exactly the same in the next moment. The body of moment A is already gone in body of moment B um, because it's changed. So um, subtle impermanence is more difficult to understand, but with you know, study and practice and meditation, we can come to understand that every single moment there's arising and passing away in our body. And then the third says, or else mindfulness that there is a body is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness. So the way that's explained is um, mindfulness establishes that there is a body. And this is the point at which your mindfulness is uh, very well developed. Um, as soon as mindfulness of the body is established, the awareness of the arising and ceasing of its components arises easily. So you're, you've been practicing for a long time, so you're very much aware of, very much familiar with the arising and passing nature of the body. And then when observing this, the understanding arises that the body, the breath and so on, are impersonal phenomena. There's no self in any part of the body. And this leads to insight. That's the real purpose of doing this practice is to gain insight, insight into impermanence and unsatisfactoriness, and then eventually selflessness. That there's no fixed, real, um, objectively existing self, I, me, in any part of our body. <clears throat> and then the fourth uh, part says, and he abides freely, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a bhikkhu, bhikkhu is a monk, but again, it, it can just mean anybody who's practicing male or female, ordained or lay. This is how you could say a practitioner abides contemplating the body as a body. And so this fourth point is talking about the result of the practice. As a result of this practice, one becomes free of clinging to anything in the world, to all the things of the world, sense objects, um, things that people normally regard as pleasure, pleasurable and desirable and so on. So one becomes free of all that kind of clinging and free of attachment and aversion. 
So this that itself isn't nirvana, but it's a step in that direction. It's leading in that direction and brings a great deal of peace. So those words um, are repeated again and again with regard to the different types of meditation on the body, breathing, postures, and so on. And also with the other um, objects of mindfulness, like feelings. So we've, we've actually finished <laughs> talking about the mindfulness of the body. And then next week, we'll start on the next, um, the second practice of mindfulness, which is on feelings. This is also very, very important. <clears throat> Yeah, so in case there's any sense of, of repulsion or aversion or fear, anxiety that might come up with regard to any of these practices, such as parts of the body, the corpse, and so on, um, then don't push yourself, you know, don't force yourself to do those practices if, they're, if, if you're very uncomfortable about them. Um, but it could also be helpful to uh, look at those feelings that might arise. Try to understand what they're all about. Are they realistic or not? Um, what kind of attitudes, thoughts, conceptions, and so on lie behind them. Like, for example, I was thinking um, the first time I, or first couple of times I uh, saw a corpse. Um, and um, <laughs> a lot of fear came up in my mind. One of the one of the one of the times was I was living in France, also with venerable children. We were living in a little community, monastic community. And one day we got this request to come and do prayers for a woman who'd passed away. And um, so a group of us with our geshe went to this this house and. Actually, we'd never met these people before, but I guess the woman's husband just wanted her to be prayed for and somehow <laughs> asked us to come. So we went into the room and there was this body lying there on the bed and she really looked awful. Um, she'd been sick with cancer for a long time. And so she was, you know, like a, almost like a skeleton and her skin was kind of yellowish and waxy looking and she died with her eyes open her eyes were wide open like this her mouth was open and her teeth were all kind of rotten so it really looked like something out of a horror movie <laughs> and I was really scared and um so our teacher the Geshe you know asked us to recite various prayers and mantras so I while I was reciting these mantras I was trying to work on my attitude and saying to myself come on you know she was you know not long ago she was like me she was like all of us she was just a person who wanted to be happy and didn't want to suffer and so on and so forth and she went through this painful experience so I was able to generate compassion and love and and that really helped to um reduce my kind of fear and aversion but I also thought why am I afraid I mean why be afraid of a corpse it doesn't really make any sense because a corpse isn't going to hurt you <laughs> you you're, it makes sense to be for, afraid of a live body because a live body might hurt you you know they could punch you or pick up something and hit you with it but what can a corpse do <laughs> I realized how kind of irrational it was to be afraid of a corpse. But I think the fear is really not of the corpse itself, but of death. You know, it's it's like a reminder that that's going to happen to me one day. And that's something we don't want to think about. We, we try to avoid thinking about that. So that's where the fear is, is coming from. So then over the years, um, having more experiences with bodies and corpses and so on, I got kind of more used to it. <laughs> got over that fear and was able to just be there and focus on praying and you know generating these positive thoughts and wishes and and so on so 
so anyway, I'm just saying that it can be useful to look at whatever fear or aversion or uh, other uncomfortable feelings that we may have and analyze them and check. Does this make sense? Why am I feeling this way? What can I do about it? Because otherwise, a lot of people, they just get stuck in their fear and try to avoid dealing with that whole issue. And so I think it's much more useful to face our fears and analyze our thoughts and our feelings and find solutions, re resolve them rather than get stuck in them. And so that's very much related to the topic we'll start with next week, feelings. <laughs> uh, any question? We only have a few minutes left, but if there's any question. <clears throat> Any of the online participants? Rushka, please go ahead. <laughs> You're laughing. You know yeah. I always got to say something. I like <laughs> my own voice. But I think I might have to mail this one to you because it's kind of long. But hold on, let me try to find it. Maybe I can try to simplify it. But you were talking. Oh, crap. Sorry. Um, I'm wondering, kind of, when we talk about um, being attached to inherent existence, I'm wondering, is it because, like, when we see different phenomena, usually course, like a birth, it appears to us as, as there's, like, coming into existence and going out of existence. We can't, like, see that continuity. So I think maybe it's our inability to see the continuity which kind of conjures up a deep rooted fear of going out of existence, hence us wanting to have something permanent. But I think that recognizing no coming and no going would then make you question, who am I and what am I? Because we can obviously see the body coming into existence, a birth and going out of existence. But if the nature is no coming, no going, then I think it just kind of snowballs into, okay, well, who am I and what am I? But I think ultimately kind of that fear of going out, going out of existence is kind of, I feel like is what makes us want to have an inherently existing reified concrete eye. This, I, I'll probably have to email it to them because it's long, but I was just <laughs> thinking maybe that's our thought process is that, you know, we'll go out of existence, essentially. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you kind of mentioned a lot of things there. Maybe it would be good if you send an email and then I can yeah, think about it and come up with an answer. That, yeah. next week. <laughs> oh, and also, too, I wanted to tell you don't feel bad about the guy talking about the senior discount and your reaction. Because, I mean, if you ask like a preschool or a kindergarten to guess how old you are, that guy asking you about a senior discount is going to sound like sweet nothings. Because I have been told I'm 190. So don't if you ever feel bad. <laughs> Ask a preschool <laughs> or a kindergarten, how old do you think I am? 65 <laughs> is going to sound like the new 20. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it was still, it was a good opportunity to recognize my kind of pride and vanity and the whole concern about how I look and what people think of me. And yeah, but... I think I'm I think I'm a bit over that now. Well, not completely. No, I wouldn't say that. Less less concerned than I was before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you do if anyone does have any questions, you can um send them by email and then oh answer them next week because I tend to just go on and on and on and don't leave half time for, for questions so if you think of questions send them in and I'll deal with them next time so let's finish by dedicating the merit the positive energy created by coming together with positive motivation listening to these teachings, very precious teachings of the Buddha and how to overcome our attachment and other afflictions that keep us in samsara and how to develop wisdom and other qualities that will enable us to reach enlightenment. So let's dedicate this positive energy to all living beings, to the enlightenment of every single sentient being. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish fulfilling wish grinning jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in this world. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who served as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Ranjanath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplished magnificent prayers honoring the three sublime ones, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Venerable, so, so much. Thank you. Venerable.